Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'd like to um, introduce our special speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. George Davis, uh, who is the uh, Dunedin Commemorations Historian. And uh, the idea of that uh, title will come out in the presentation. Uh, George has made a particular study of um, the medical school and the, the dental school, particularly in the years of the Second World War and the uh, matters that surrounded that. So he's going to talk tonight on the most unusual times at uh, the University of Otago Medical School during World War II. So please welcome George Davis. Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. Welcome to you all, both here in person and online. My thanks go to Professor Terry Doyle for inviting me to talk and to Professor John Hyten for nominating me and persuading me to put forward a research topic I've been working on for a while. John also reminded me of a key interest for those following medical matters, it's about people, people. My thanks go to colleagues, librarians, and friends in the Hocken Library, without whose help over so many years, this talk wouldn't be possible. And also credit must go to Dr. Claire Elizabeth Le Couture for her 2013 PhD thesis, Dentist Dr. Dean. Professor Sir Charles Herkes and his record of fostering research at the Otago Medical School, 1921-1958. This is an excellent thesis setting out some material which I refer to in the achievements of Sir Charles. First, a brief background. The period 1939-1945 could be called a most unusual time. These are the words of Registrar Herbert Chapman who I'll introduce in picture later on, writing to a potential student, Miss M.C. Cross, on the 21st of December, 1944. For the second time in 20 years, the medical school was thrown into the cauldron of war. This was not unexpected because there were obvious warnings of an oncoming war since 1937. If you looked at the newspapers, or magazines like the New Zealand Free Lance, you can see it plain as day, at least for us now in hindsight. However, there was much public unease. Some influential voices argued that it was a nonsense to see German reunification and rearmament under a Nazi government as any more, anything more than self-protection. Also, the peace movement was strong in the late 20s and 30s, particularly in Britain and America. In this peak age, when we must remember, it wasn't a television age, it was the peak age of re reading and writing. Writers like Aldous Huxley, Vera Britton, and Bertrand Russell were widely read. The British government itself was divided and prior to September 1939 was supporting a foreign policy of appeasement towards Nazi Germany. The drums of war sounded louder, but few particularly here in New Zealand, wanted to listen or saw the signs. I'm setting out here the, the sections of the talk that I'll go through, the control measures by the wartime Labour government, responses of staff and student to the impositions of war, an outline of medical innovations in the period and the talk will trace the investment of the medical school and its staff, students and graduates to the defence of the nation and the British Empire. And it's not lastly, because I've changed it a bit, changes to the school, that's lastly. That's the construction of the school. But in amongst the talk will be small pictures, vignettes of some medical personnel involved in the conflict. My study derives from a discovery in 2012, a significant absence of World War II 
remembrance symbols within the precinct of the University of Otago. Strange, because there was a widespread public acknowledgement that the university faculties of medicine and dentistry had contributed a great deal to the war effort, but there were few attempts after 1945 to remember their part. This, in contrast with World War I, recognition for involvement. There seemed to be a lack of balance in memory of events in World War II, and perhaps more, a silence. The medical school happenings were closely scrutinized, particularly in the newspaper. However, between 1939 and 45, many events had a cloak of secrecy drawn over their activities for the national war effort. At the time, very few students and academic staff had a detailed or accurate grasp of what was really happening at the national level. And that was intentional. The government didn't want to advertise exactly what it was doing so that anybody anywhere around the world could read it later. So this attempt, talk attempts to uncover the background to some of the medical school events in the period 1939-45. Control measurement measures taken by the wartime Labour government under acting, then Prime Minister Peter Fraser. On the death of Michael Joseph Savage, Peter Fraser was the Prime Minister from March 1940 to December 1949. So he survived the war in terms of remaining as a Prime Minister. Many Prime Ministers didn't. Churchill, for example. Change began almost immediately with the declaration of war in Britain, France, and New Zealand on the 3rd of September, 1939. The University of Otago administration of subjects and buildings were both affected. Medical boards were established in the dental schools to assess the physique of enlisted men. However, of a more long-term impact for the university were the impositions placed on the coursing of students who were in training, students taken out or decide to go of them, their own will into the military. Quickly, some subjects gained prominence in the war effort. And this is a priority order of list put out in early 1940 by the government. Physics, electronic applications of all kinds and thankfully, medicine and dentistry. That priority order was very important because it changed later. During World War II, difficulties were filling the second and third intakes for overseas service in 1939 and 40, and Allied disasters of May 1940 led the government reluctantly to reintroduce conscription with the National Service Emergency Regulations on the 18th of June 1940, and under the Defence Act, the previous Emergency Regulations Amendment Act of 31st of May, 1940. All men aged between 18 and 46 became liable to be called up by ballot. Volunteering for the army service ceased on the 22nd of July, 1940. So after the 22nd of July, 1940, men were conscripted because there was a fall off of men volunteering. Though entry to the Navy and Air Force remained voluntary, from January 1942, men and some women could be manpowered or directed to essential industries. And I'll refer to that in the case of one particular young woman. Conscientious objection was allowed under the legislation if the applicant could prove satisfaction of the local appeal board that he had objected on conscientious grounds and held them before the beginning of the war. Only 200 cases nationally were approved. 800 were imprisoned for failing to comply with regulations. A total of 194,000 New Zealand men served in the armed forces during the war. And despite a scurrilous rumor at the time that university students in, here in Otago were dodging the enlistment process, my study over the last 10 years has unveiled evidence to the contrary. Many students caught up in enlistment 
applied for either postponement of military camp training or a concession pass, which was called a war pass to progress to academic qualifications. And this was done over and over, a great deal of correspondence on it. On their return, rehabilitation bursaries were issued to some. The war concession pass was most reluctantly granted in subjects with a practical component like physics. The administration of student courses was made much more complex with the advent of camp training for enlisted men in late September, with the exception of medical men and dentals who joined the camp later. Now, this impacted on Herkus and what he did. The Chancellor of the University reported on changes undertaken in terms, in terms to allow students to attend territorial training camps. This was affected by eliminating the spring vacation for all classes except those in medicine and dentistry. So the terms examinations were completed before the end of September for most, with the exception of medicine and dentistry. So the position of medical students was recognized as special. Their assessments were not to be compromised and medical student entry to Burnham camp came a little later than the mass of other students. The response of staff and students to the impositions of war. Here we have a picture of a key figure in the university. The importance of this man is not really understood and it's, I think, underestimated a great deal. Central figure in this process was the respected and experienced University of Otago Registrar, Herbert Chapman, who served in the office 37 years. Now that's a lifetime of working. Most postal material crossed his desk. All departmental material crossed his desk. And apart from designated private correspondence, he and his staff made copies of all letters. And as a historian, I couldn't be more grateful. From our point of view, in the computer age, 84 years later, it is impossible to assess the influence of Herbert Chapman on staff and student students. He had a key role in communications and was often found acting as a buffer against the intervention of Wellington-based administrators and the local university. People like Ernest Marsden, and his successor from mid-1944, the controller of manpower, H.L. Bockett. So, this man, an Englishman, Ernest Marsden, not Sir Ernest at that stage, not even doctor at that stage. He had a BSc from Manchester in 1923, and he was head of the New Zealand Department of, Industrial, uh, of Scientific and Industrial Research and was most influenced in shaping the courses and subsequent careers of some Otago graduates. The, a DSIR official and stri strictly confidential matter letter of mid 1941 from Marsden to the Registrar Chapman went straight to the heart of the matter regarding the need to, quali uh, to qualify trained, skilled radio personnel. And there it is. There is an urgent need for skilled radio personnel in the fighting services and for the problems of research and development and connection herewith. It is very desirable that urgent action be taken both to provide such men for immediate use and to train men to a point where they will be useful and be absorbed into such services, either for New Zealand or the service of British Empire. He was narrowly focused. That was his main thrust and he stuck with it until he left New Zealand in mid-1944. All the universities in the UK and, and some in, the, in Canada were also cooperating with this scheme. Immediately it was correspond, uh, responded to by Chapman on the 5th of June saying he would forward the correspondence from Marsden to Otago's renowned head of physics, Professor Jack, Professor Jack of radio fame in 1924. The hand of Ernest Marsden was firmly imprinted on events of mid-1941 up to his departure for England in mid-1944, where he was looking both into uh, radio physics for the uh, chain home uh, radar installations on the southeast coast of England and into radioactivity matters. 
Of greatest help to the scheme in seeing radiophysics as a key to the war effort was a meeting of New Zealand's professors of physics held in the council room of the DSIR in June 41. The resolutions of this group were wide ranging and came at a cost, a cost both financial and in steering young men to where they wanted them to be. Papers indicate that the University of New Zealand Colleges of Physics professors gathered in Wellington and provided estimates of costs, including two year period and the ramifications of doing away with the end of year examinations. Doing away with the end of year examinations. You can imagine how well that was going to be taken by the, the deans and professors. Further, Registrar Chapman found himself acting as an intermediary between University of Marsden over the matter of resourcing the government office of grants and fielding suggestion of professors on how to use the offered dis disbursements. In mid-August 1941, he thanked Marsden for the information regarding a £1,000 offer um, for initial apparatus to be used in courses in radio physics. There was an exchange of letter correspondence between Chapman and Ernest Marsden over the errors which Chapman saw in the financial application. Again, you can imagine how that went down. Here's one of the things that really got people hopped up, hopping up and down. The proposal to shorten the course. In Dean Herkes's annual report of December 41, there was the request of the government and after consultation with the Australian medical schools, full consideration was given to the proposal to shorten the medical course by six months in order to meet the unprecedented remand, demand for medical practitioners of the armed forces. And it was decided for New Zealand the proposal shortening was not in the best interests of the state, nor was it in the best interests of the medical school. The public or the profession to meet the emergency, 60 year students in the last six months of their course could be permitted to carry on re relieving duties as health surgeons throughout the hospital dominions or boarding sometimes was a fancy, fancy medical term meaning placed where there was a need for a locum in local areas, provided that this placement in no case exceeded 50%, that is 50% of the time, I guess. This was an extremely important decision aimed at partly addressing the government needs, but more to ensure that the standards of medicine remained high. However, it did not address the problem of decreasing accommodation for existing students in the medical school. And this was the bugbear that went through really from 1939 up to the beginning of the building of the South, South or what we call the Herkes building. So how did this start? In the early months of 1940, the medical school was under considerable strain despite the local needs. Some lecturing staff had gone off volunteering this compounded a situation where some lecturers had to take up the strain for those who have left. To understand the situation, you can't get a trained doctor to do lecturing at a moment's notice. The whole thing had to be advertised and it would take three or four months at the very least to get this going. Students were worried about their ability to pass units when military training was imposed on them. So it was working at that end as well. Um, some students were told that they had because of their passes, most often, or not non-passes, they had to go into military training. A comprehensive statement on cyclostyle sheet from the New Zealand Registrar, JJ McKen McKenzie, reassuring students following a meeting between the New Zealand University Students Association and the Minister of Education stated that where students could not gain a war concession pass based on their terms, on representation, the manpower committees, therefore their territorial training would be postponed after the November examination period. Now that was part of a debate that was going on. Could they take people who'd only done terms but hadn't done examinations? And the answer was, well, yes, they could, but you could apply to the manpower committee to, be, to have suspension of your military service until the examinations had happened. It was felt in that regard overseas service for some time would elapse before the overseas ballot would be held. And so 
Thomas Hunter, who was head of the New Zealand University, advised Chapman that the minister messaged the student body that territorial training would be postponed until the November examinations. Next day, Chapman responded with a gracious letter saying, there does seem to be a good deal of confusion in the handling of the university problem. We have hardly known what steps we should take. This material was forwarded, forwarded to the editor of the ODT for publication. But it goes further. Senior lecturers and professors were not immune from the tentacles of manpowering and military service. Telegram, indicating national importance of some university personnel. Denham, Chancellor of the University uh, of Canterbury. I have authority, Minister of Supply State, that it is a matter of vital importance that SOPA, that's Professor SOPA, in chemistry, Devote all full-time war activities, Wellington forthwith. Stop. This is in sort of military speak. Appears probable to me that in some months' time, resumption university activities, part-time capacity may be possible, but present need is urgent and grave. Grave. Denham, chairman, also CSIR. Telegram. Chancellor at Target University, the Prime Minister Fraser, advising he had the telegram requesting the release of Dr. Soper, Professor F.G. Soper of the Chemistry Department, from Dr. Denham, Canterbury College, for his Minister of Supply. Chancellor asked for verification from the PM. Secret letter from the Prime Minister, Peter Fraser, the Chancellor Morrell of Otago University. Dear Sir, the government is most anxious to avail itself fully of the services of Professor F.G. Soper, a member of the professorial staff of Otago University, in connection with chemical problems relating to musicians, not mun musicians, munitions, sorry. And I wish it was musicians. And take this opportunity of writing to you to secure your sympathetic cooperation in this war effort. The rest of the letter stresses SOPA's importance in reviewing the field of explosives, seeking a portion of each week for SOPA's time in Wellington and making some preliminary arrangements for his role as a departmental supervisor and lecturer to be taken by others. So what they were doing was trying to get Soper out for three months. Munitions training didn't happen so much in New Zealand. It happened in Sydney at the munitions depot there. And there was one other quite well-known later professor that I can't divulge because I had a, a talk with him once and he asked me if I'd signed the declaration of uh, or oath of secrecy to, to the Crown. And the funny thing was I had when I was about 18 delivering letters for the post office as a part-time job. The end of that conversation was, huh, goodbye. So I can't really tell you who it was. The correspondence of mid... Um, Mid-February 42 is of vital importance to the implementation of the war effort and to pro processes adopted by the university colleges in response to demands of manpowering agencies, especially the Defence Scientific Advisory Committee headed by Marsden, Director of Scientific Developments Defence Services. It was pretty obvious that they saw the university classes as a pull to train specialist personnel and give scientific training, especially selected men, to fit them for conditions of the present mechanized war. But in that time, the committee altered the priority list of the kind of people they wanted. And lo and behold, the priority list now reads medicine, dentistry, engineering, physical and natural applied sciences, Agriculture and architecture. We will now note that medicine and dentistry were at the top of the list. While the committee had at present no recommendation to make in courses, it, it did request each university college supply a central selection committee as, to a central selection committee a list of male students who completed one year's satisfactory course of study and being called up for military service, whom 
The college council recommended postponement of full-time military service to enable them to finish their university course. Now, this, is, this involved our registrar, Herbert Chapman. He was the one who had to supply all these lists. So Marsden and Co. in the DSIR say, we want full names, we want the course, we want the passes, um, and we want what is proposed as the next year's course alongside each person's name. So, firstly, in reply, accidentally, I'm sure, the list went forward with, with only F. Smith, Chemistry 1, um, Physics 1, no, no grading. So there was an awful lot of to and froing. And to understand that, you have to understand that it wasn't just a debate. It was the fact that in, in New Zealand, from Dunedin to Wellington, you could post a letter in the post, main post office, you know the big building, the main post office, in the afternoon, it arrived in, the, in Wellington that evening. Next morning, it would go, go out. And that afternoon, it would be replied to, put in a, put in a email, and it would be down here in Dunedin the next morning. Try doing that with anything but email. So now, this incursion in the into the coursing of students or wanting to know everything about them had begun and perhaps more so under Marsden's successor, Bocket, the man on the left of the picture, Herbert, with his brother Arthur. They're both wearing their CMG, so the photo is later of 1972. And the tall one, he, he had quite a distinguished career in the civil service, which, of course, was very powerful in those days. It was a sort of a managerial system for um, orders from the government through to ordinary people. So let's have a brief aside. Here we have Mary Litster O'Halloran, Nee Burnett, delightful lady. And the file that I looked at for this was a record of the only woman I've been able to find so far who was directed by the Manpower Department in 1945 to abandon medical studies and take up home economics, a subject useful for the war effort. Now we can't, we can't apply our modern spectacles looking at it. You, you just got to accept this was the way of the world. Women were meant to be behind the kitchen sink, stainless by 1950, and so on. Although she was accepted by the University of Taka Medical School as a graduate entry student, the Department of Manpower under Bockett decreed that graduates could not be accepted in the medical school, but instead should do work of national importance. However, Litster, that is, she used her middle name, Litster was determined to go to medical school and could not be dissuaded. She arranged me meetings with members of parliament, Sydney Holland and Mabel Howard, and with the Minister of Manpower, Andrew McLagan, to argue her case. Still, no avail. Bocket, controller of manpower, sought assurance that she was completing a home science course. And the registrar, Herbert Chapman, restated that she was indeed taking home science course and would complete it in 1947. I thought this strange. Why would Bocket be so keen to see a talented? She was really talented. Her grades in Canterbury had been quite phenomenal. Postgraduate young woman refused entry in medicines. She'd already graduated BA in Canterbury College in 44 with some honours and co uh, subsequently completed her MBCHB in Otago in 1951. A year later, she married another MBCHB, also graduating in 51, Walter John O'Halloran. She became a highly respected general practic practitioner, primarily in Onehunga. I had a delightful phone call with her husband. He was about 92 at the time. I'm not going to make a mockery by saying everything, but he was fairly doddery and didn't understand what I was trying to get at. And so I said, could I, see, could I speak to Dr. Mary O'Halloran? Oh, Litster. Are you talking about Litster? 
Oh, yes, let's do it. The penny dropped pretty quickly on my end anyway. And he told me, no, I couldn't. I said, oh, Lord, he's gone. No, she was in the shower. Um, so that ruled that out. Um, however, after an interesting 20 minutes or so with Walter on the phone, I said I would write a letter. I wrote a letter, and exactly two weeks later, a beautiful letter, copper plate Victorian writing, came in return from Litster, uh, commending me on my research and saying everything I'd said about it was correct. You could go ahead and publish it. Right. Let us now look at someone else. This is a this is a uh, image from a painting of Hercus around about 1968, I think. Maybe a wee bit earlier. Charles Hercus, born in Dunedin, 13th of June, 1888, died in March 71, rightly remembered for his fostering research by members of his staff and students. While he was in Christchurch in his early 30s, he began a joint study with Dr. Eleanor Baker to study the effects of the goiter enlargement in school children. And eventually, their research led to the application of iodine, traces of iodine added to the table salt of right round the nation so you could buy iodized salt, either plain salt or iodized salt. I remember seeing it on the sides of the containers. But, and between 1921 and 26, there was considerable study in the effects of thyroid enlargement. And it was found that Canterbury province, for whatever reason, had the highest incidence. And Herkes described this as a public health problem of the greatest magnitude. So he got a Department of Health grant to supply 0.065 gram tablets of potassium iodide to school children in the primary schools. And that seemed to be successful. Now, the next argument was, what caused this? And all I can say about that is it went on, this argument went on for years on end, right through the war and right out the end of it, and no conclusion was reached on why it was said. But in that whole issue, Herkes set his exemplar, his table of what to do to get a research grant, outline the problem, set up a team, do preliminary analysis, apply for funding, select senior students to examine different aspects of the condition and choose selected researchers to investigate outcomes and write papers for the matter. And that formula followed him through into his other studies. And most of them expanded at the time when the Medical Research Council was established in, in Dunedin, in, in the medical school. Research areas were on nutrition, goiter, hydatus, and dental caries. And it was expanded in 1939 to inve investigate tuberculosis. Now, you might think, oh, well, there wasn't much tuberculosis. Well, there was about 3% in New Zealand per 100, 3 per 100. Each of these fields reflected existing research, and the Otago Medical School, for example, already in a high data disease research and prevention department, headed by Lewis Barnett, who had pursued this interest since the 1890s. Now, that's a long time. Charles Herkes directed the research into goiter, nutrition under Mar Muriel Bell. And that last one assumed increasing importance through the Second World War. And two or three uh, practitioners in home science, highly qualified by the 1930s, were sent, uh, one to American forces, uh, and she was the chief dietitian of a whole battalion of American forces. And the other one uh, went to England and was um, in charge of the experimental kitchen in London for um, the dietary benefit of the population. Clinical 
Clinical medicine was also added, and a future Nobel Prize winner, John Eccles, led the neurophysiology and neuropathy research during the six years in New Zealand. And there was an acceptance of wider responsibility for the Southwest Pacific and the creation of an Islands Territory Territories Research Committee. The Goita study was went right through the 30s into the 40s, and there was a chemist and a polymath, a man who was quite a bit of a genius, Dick Perves, who co-wrote papers on endemic goita. And he was still around and known about when I started the university in 1962. The issue of tuberculosis was worrying. It was worrying from a medical point of view and, and, and simply from a personal health point of view. There was a high incidence of TB amongst returned servicemen, about 10% in total. Uh, patients had known contact with the disease and yearly in this group there was a growing percentage of ex-servicemen. 1945 was 9%, 1946, 16%, 1947, 26%. And the Travis bequest offered uh, £12,000 over seven years to the medical school for research, research in tuberculosis. Now, that was a great fun benefit. The bequest was greatly appreciated by Herkes as a wide, wise decision. By trustees, and the newspaper filled the editorial with more details. Tuberculosis caused 589 deaths in New Zealand in 1938, with a mortality rate of 3.91 per 10,000 of population. Majority of deaths were from respiratory tuberculosis. Now, I want to cut down the, the whole forest of numbers and say that it was a, a fright caused in 1943-44 in the medical school, and in the hospital. It took them a moment to work out what was going on. Herkes in 44 sent a note to concerned parties that there was, in the previous 18 months, there were many cases of pulmonary tu tuberculosis and pleurisy with effusion amongst the medical and nursing staffs of Dunedin Hospital and among medical students. Five recent graduates have been admitted to the sanatoria. What had happened? Well, I don't think you need too many clues to work it out. Medical students in the senior year went to, went to the wards. They picked up tuberculosis. They carted it back to the medical school, more medical students and so on. So there were Mantu tests, which are a standardized test for, for um, tuberculosis, radiography uh, results, lesions detected, treatment given, an extent of desirability, and the names of those who were affected was listed. And the results of, uh, there was a, a list made and a survey made, and it was to be used for statistical purposes, and the material in it was to be confidential. The impact of Dean Herkes should not be underestimated. He was driven, conscientious, and caring. His work ethic and relationships with stu students, staff, present and past, was laid out in a vast array of documents held in the Hocken Lock Lock Library archives. He wrote to his close friend, Sir Louis Barnett in Hamden, that the pressure of work was great and we're in the thick of professional examinations, an increasingly heavy burden as the tide of students increases. I'm seriously impressed by the work output. It was suggested to me that Dean Herkes had trouble sleeping. Uh, the person who said it another way. He was also a micromanager when the occasion demanded. And his uh, attention was drawn more and more to the prior problems arising with the progress of the new lecture theater in the Scott building and the, um, the building of the South to become Herkes building. I want now very quickly to look at how many medical students um, actually were there in the, in the school. Now, I put the first set of numbers down the left-hand side because they are straight out of Herkes's reports. 
But the other numbers are confusing. Um, it is, to be honest, a, uh, a mess which barely has any co cohesion. There are one or two things you can tell, though. The, new, the student number between 1939 and 1945 increased by roughly 30 to 40%. Yet the accommodation was unchanged for the most of that period. So you crowded an extra 30, 40% of all students, barring year one students who were doing medical intermediate, into the buildings that existed, which was the Scott Building and the Lindo Ferguson Building on the right. In this analysis, the basis for the recording of numbers did not remain constant. That's part of the reason why it was confusing. Perkis always wrote his reports in November, December. So what you're getting there is the ones that lasted out to the end of the year. The others were given to um, the Department of Statistics by Herbert Chapman, and it may have included people who joined at the beginning of the year. The number of graduates reflected the smaller intakes of 1937-38, much less than the government hoped for. And I think when the government applied pressure on the university to expand, in 1943, the numbers intake from 100 to 120 in the second year, first year professional, second year, they somehow had in their mind that this would somehow turn on a tap of available GPs or, or recently graduated MBCHBs to either go into the nation and take the place of experienced medics that went out overseas, or they would be able to go straight into the army. Such was not the case. In 2013 onwards, I worked on constructing an Excel database uh, under, the, under the supervision of Professor David McBride in the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine. Sources for the war in that period of 2981 total from all faculties being graduates, undergraduates, and technicians, 2172, or 73%, were Army enlistments, 568 were Air Force branches, and 241, the various Navy groups. Dean Herkes's immediate post-war figures are significantly lower that talking about how many dentists and medical staff went. He put the medical staff at 444, but I think, well, there's two things at that, that work here. He didn't have the access to online search material that we have now. And secondly, he was probably going from RSA and word of mouth reports. Also, there's another factor in this whole thing that people who don't know tend to overlook. It takes three years to get to a bachelor's degree in most of the art subjects, four years for an honors degree, six years at the minimum to educate a doctor from prelim through to final year, final professional and the year after that they get MBCHB. People who think you can just turn on the tap like that are severely mistaken. Now, not all medics who went away to war took six years. Some of them took, the average was about 7.2. One or two had nine years to get MBCHB. I, I wondered about that, but however, it was in the record, so I had to believe it. During the course of the war, the staff and students of the medical school, in addition to supplying a large number of acting house surgeons to the base hospitals of the Dominion, took part in the medical boarding in the Dunedin area, and that's beyond supply. At the height of the Japanese threat, Otago University Medical Corps provides 50 senior students as regimental medical officers in the Army and Air Force, Air Force establishments throughout the Dominion. A company of field ambulance at Blenheim, a field ambulance at Rakaia, a fortress field ambulance at Dunedin. I'm not sure what a fortress was. 
should be stated that the staff and students at the dental school also perform as an integral part of the full contribution to this effort. Now, I want now to take a look at one or two people. This is a man with the uh, really unusual name, R Rear Surgeon Rear Admiral Sir Gordon Gordon Taylor, which I thought was a trip up by the typist, but it wasn't. I've done a bit of work into him. He gave a radio address here in Dunedin on Sunday, the 25th of November. He praised the training of Otago medical graduates. He further commended the foresight of the country for establishing a medical research council and placing its workers in the medical school. He was a closely associated New Zealand surgeons working in Britain during the war, particularly in the guinea pig unit. And perhaps with an eye to the future, he said, New Zealand is probably wise in concentrating her resources in one medical school. I can understand how that might not go down well further north ahead. And until the population of the country has increased to four or five thousand, uh, millions, it might be unwise to duplicate your medical education centre that you have at present. The present arrangement must surely be admirable. Turn your eyes to what the graduates have achieved. By their fruits, ye shall know them. I thought that's pretty biblical, actually. However, um, I'm going to look now at some people very quickly. Oh, that's the plan. Um, two buildings were going on at the same time, two building projects. And this one was finished earlier. Now, it's very hard to work out exactly. Oh, this thing here is the central lecture theatre in the Scott building. I don't know whether it's still there. It's further towards the rear, and it takes up a lot of the floor space of the lecture th uh, of the the building. Anyway, that was eventually finished around about 1945, and of course, it was ongoing at the same time as Hercus was trying to push through the South Building, now called the Hercus Building. And Hercus was adamant about getting that done. He was both a member of the Works Committee and uh, chaired by Mr. Steele, who was Works Manager for the University. And he had a small committee, which was called the Building Committee, which ran parallel and pushed through things that, that had to be done. Anyway, enough of that. Lieutenant William Bremner Hyatt, MBCHB 1934. Uh, this is a piece from the War Graves Project. Registered in England 15th of August 1935, FRS England 1938, Nuffield Scholar 1940 at, at Oxford University. Hungarian Professor in Royal College of Surgeons, Jacksonian Prize 1942. And as soon as he graduated in 1934, he went off on a bird ex expedition, BYRD, to the Antarctic as a medical officer. Following this venture, he spent some months in postgraduate orthopaedic study. Attached to a number of institutions in Norfolk and London, had a research grant from Oxford allowed him to time and resources to suffer to study peripheral nerve damage at the nerve center at the Wingfield Morris Hospital, where he later took charge of that unit. But unfortunately, in 1942, he was on this passenger ship Ceramic when it was torpedoed off the Kenyan coast by an undersea boat um, submarine while on passage from, to Cape Town on the 7th of December, 1942. He'd been practicing orthopedic surgery in Oxford before he was posted to Cape Town. His death was described in the New Zealand Medical Journal, volume 42, 1943, as the medical profession of the English speaking world suffered a serious loss that W. Bremner Hyatt sailed for England for the Middle East on a ship which failed to reach its destination. Uh, we'll skip that. That's a view 
This was all meant to be finished by about 1946. This was a view of the what we now know as the Hercus building from Hanover Street in 1947. So it was not an openable condition. A lot of scaffolding right around it, and it was still being constructed in some areas. So that's looking from approximately where the Dunedin Orchestra, the Hanover Street Baptist Church, just to the center of town of that and looking down the street. I want to give a personal note here. This was Robert Edmund Ballantyne. We have a close personal co connection. He was a respected GP in Dunedin in the late 40s and 60s to the late 80s, and was married on, after the death of his first wife, Dorothy, uh, to Dorothy Mary Neal White. Her deceased husband had managed Newbold's bookshop. Do any of you remember it? It was um, opposite where Terry's was, approximately, in 394 George Street, close by Frederick Street. Dr. Ballantyne gained his MBCHB in 1943. He had been in the Otago University Medical Corps while a student and transferred to the New Zealand Medical Corps as a second lieutenant in September 1942. And as a sixth year student, he was posted to Outram in the Tyree Plain for his first placement. In November 1942, he attended Fred Davis, my father, who had a disastrous fall while shunting railway wagons at Shan's Good Yard, Goods Yard, about a quarter of the way between Outram and Wellington. Dad suffered severe crush injuries to both legs. Dr. Ballantyne applied tunicase and saved my father's life. Both legs were subsequently am amputated by orthopedic surgeon Major Effie White of, of fame. <laughs> My father lived to 39 years, if he said he wouldn't, <laughs> and finished his employment with the New Zealand Railways as a clerk at the Mosgill Station. After the incident, accident, um, Dr. Ballantyne practiced in Central Otago and then Dunedin until his retirement. So Dr. Ballantyne was GP to my wife, Judith, and to me just after we were married in 1967. Probably a shocking photo, probably the most well-known uh, overseas apart from the people in the plastic center, overseas uh, doctor coming out of New Zealand was Douglas Waddell Jolly, principal medical officer at the limb fitting center at Roehampton. But he, excuse me for a minute. He wrote, Field surgery and total war it took me years to find this. This is the American, the American uh, medical establishment's copy. And it was once owned by Curry, Ward 4, 45, 39 Grant Place, Grant City, Staten Island, New York. And I, I got it through a bookseller. But the same one, published by Hamish Hamilton in London in 1940, was the one, if you want to find a famous book, get that one. The, now, the foreword to the book was written by, of all people, Surgeon Rear Admiral Gordon Gordon Taylor. All a case of two degrees again, who visited in 1945. As a result, the book publication is distributed in distribution UK, and in America, it became the most well-known orthopedic publication amongst the Allies. Now, Jolly's experience, I won't go through all the material that was put out by Mark Derby, a central Otago historian who has recently published a book on Jolly, but Jolly was interested primarily in one particular instance, that is putting a field hospital as close to the front line as you possibly could. And at the Ebro River, he used to have one in a cave, uh, which was safe from bombing. And as a result of saving a number of people's lives, he was awarded the Republican Army's Medalla del Ebro, the um, medal of Ebro. A 
Fellow surgeon, Dr. Moises Brogi, recalls him as a top quality surgeon who was very popular with the Spanish. And he left Spain along with other foreign volunteers in 1938. They were given the option of leaving or being pursued by the Franco government. Returned to New Zealand and made a nationwide speaking tour, published his medical manual, Field Surgery in Total War in October 1940, joined the Royal Army Medical Corps and assigned to Tobruk with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And he was awarded a military OBE, the citation referring to his untiring zeal and quiet but thorough methods. Dr. Douglas Jolly died after a long illness in New Zealand, 1983. Florence Eileen Craig, whom you probably have never heard of, injured in the SS Koala on the 14th of February, 1942, died on active service. It's recorded in the University Council Minutes. Active service. Now, that implies that she was a military figure. She was in the hospital that she operated in Malaya, her, her title was Lady Doctor. Sounds quite cute these days. Lady Doctor. Um, and she was highly respected. Dean of the 300 graduates at the school who were serving at the time of writing, over 300, Dean Herkes recorded himself deaths in active service of Major Wynne Irwin, WLM Gilmore, and Dr. Florence Craig. She was buried at Xinjiang Island, which is where the boat was. She, she was uh, and was bombed, and later reinterred in a mili Malayan military cemetery. Now, that's there's a, a number of references to her that you can look at, but some of the stories are sort of mixed. One thing is quite evident: until she could not move when they were on Xinjiang Island. She got people who were injured to come to her and she bandaged them. She disinfected their wounds with whatever she had at hand. And she carried on until she expired. Um, unfortunately, her two sisters, Dr. Tessie Thompson and Risa and a friend, Zessie, and her sister, Nessie Craig, were imprisoned by the Japanese, but lived through the war. Now, there's various accounts of where they lived or where they didn't as well. The last person I want to mention just here is Sir William Manchester, um, with a number of awards and degrees. Lieutenant Colonel in the MZ, NZBC, <laughs> in the NZMC, was on nominal role two. Um, graduated in 1938, so he was quite young. Passed his primary FRCS as an undergraduate in 1934. How he did that, I don't know. Being examined by Gordon, Gordon Taylor. He was a maxillofacial surgeon working along with other surgeons under Sir Archibald McIndoe, University of Otago, 1924, Rainsford Molam, University of Otago, 1925, Delph Gillies, Cambridge University, Gonville and Caius College and St. Bart's, the inventor of the pedicle or tube technique of grafting. So he had a quite distinguished career um, in 22 Battalion, which was called the Wellingtons, and then later in New Zealand hospitals. Now, I, I knew we were going to run out of time. I actually timed the number of words I had, and I didn't realize how, you know, how restrictive it was. But right at this moment, um, if any of you want to ask questions, you can. I may be able to answer them or not. Okay. Who's up for all? You want to get a question? Is this... oh, thank you. I've got a question. Um, 
you mentioned the, the ballot at the beginning of the you, you talk, the, the ballot for um, to be called up. What percentage of men were likely to be called up out of 100 men? How many would win the ballot? In the whole New Zealand population? Oh, yes. I mean, of, of 100 men eligible to be conscripted, roughly what percentage, roughly, would have been called up? 1%, 100%? No, 100%. about 85. 85%. And the rest would be more often than not manpowered. Like my father was manpowered before he went back into, he was manpowered in the New Zealand railways. My uncle said he was in, in Burnham at the time. What do you mean by manpower? They were he was directed instructed what by the Ministry of Manpower to take up a job with particular, like um, Lipster had been manpowered um, into home economics. She didn't want to take home any economics. Yes, yes. She tweaked the course so that in 1945, it also included two of the subjects for uh, preliminary, for mid-prelim. I think she's a really bright cookie. Yeah. Another question. I have another question, actually. The, the Otago University Medical Corps, yeah. which exists now, what was its fate during the war? In other words, did a whole lot of them get conscripted? No. Or were they uh, immune? Or what happened to them? No, they had a variety of things. Um, a lot of them, because they were primarily medical students with one or two dentals, were um, held in the university until the end of the November examinations, and then they were sent off for training. Um, but after that, they may or may not be forced to join the army. Most of them weren't. It's quite unusual. A lot of them, of course, were asked by um, a medical school to go and take the place of um, people who were in places like Outram or Allenton, because the doctor from that area had volunteered and gone off. So I would say at least half of them would have been boarded for local supply all over New Zealand. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your talk. May I, uh, the tuberculosis uh, breakout in the hospital and so forth, 1943, uh, just 44, I, I wondered the causation of that. I mean, after about 1943, after the desert uh, campaign, the first and second echelons were granted furlough, right, and were allowed to return to New Zealand and returned en masse around 1943, late 1943, 44. Do you think that that, that was the cause of the outbreak of the tuberculosis at that time, the return of the large numbers of servicemen from uh, Europe who came back on furlough? It, it very definitely was a cause of the increase uh, even if it wasn't. Uh, a cause of the increase. Um, there was an, a TB endemic in the population anyway, maybe 2.53%, but it bumped up to about three and a half or um, maybe 30, th 35 to 40 in every 10,000 kind of thing. Um, and it was noticed, of course, by Herkes. Immediately, it was in the uh, students of the medical school. I think we might have been turned off. Anyway. Um, People may be interested to learn that there's a new book on Doug, Doug Jolly's life, which has just been yes. published. Yes. Uh, the boy from Cromwell who became an international surgeon and his work in the Spanish Civil War was outstanding, but it, it's a book that's well worth re reading. By Mark Derby. Yes, yes. That's yeah, a great that's a sort of follow-up to field surgery itself. Maybe it's decided that the hour's up, like we're past the hour. Thank you very much for the interesting lecture. I just would like to ask you, has the curriculum at the School of Medicine changed and adjusted to the wartime needs, or has it remained unchanged as the pre-war period? Well, I'm Thank not you. really qualified to answer that. Um, I think that um, 
Terry might be able to answer it more accurately, but my perception of it is that um, there have been episodes in um, Afghanistan, Western Ariane, um, where, uh, where, where uh, army medics were needed. John, can you answer that question? Oh, thanks. <laughs> John is a ex army army medic. Yeah. Mm. I, I think that the basic course um, in physiology, anatomy, and ENT, and all the other, you've got a basic course and then you've got specialization. I think that's remained relatively standard for most of the time. Uh, it's only in times of national emergency that you undertake those measures which we hear of from about World War II. And of course, in World War I, it was even slightly more extreme that um, a unit of students was sent over to, I don't think it was Gallipoli, I think it was to the Western Front. It was Gallipoli. Was it Gallipoli? Oh, I stand corrected. I was going to ask if you, I, I'm a pediatrician by, by nature, and um, I was going to ask you if you knew, Counted Montgomery Spencer because he uh, in this because he was a graduate he went to Gallipoli as a as a medical student came back finished his career uh, his training then went back to World War One then came back and then went to World War Two died in World War Two after he'd had lots of arguments with Truby King before the, leaving the country um, and he died of uh, I think it was typhoid or or something like that you know not in battle but. He's a very important pediatrician in New Zealand. Hmm. Other comment? No more comments? I'd like everyone to join me in thanking uh, a very wonderful lecture for this evening. Thank you. <laughs>